Los media station. Making sense of the news. News Talk 105.9. News now. WMAL News at 6. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Matthews. As many as 100,000 people expected to fill the National Mall for an event called the March for Israel, an opportunity to speak out against anti Semitism and. Now. On News Talk 105.9 WMAL. O'Connor and Company. It is 6.07. It's O'Connor and Company. Thank you for letting us be a part of your routine. This Tuesday morning in the nation's capital. Coming up later in the program in just 30 minutes, William Daroff, CEO of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, talk about today's planned March for Israel on the National Mall. It's 7.05. Representative August Pfluger of the Texas, uh, uh, from Texas, talk about the border crisis. 7.35, Mark Paletta, talk about the latest out of the Supreme Court. 8.05, Adam Gallette, Accuracy in Media. And then at 8.35, Greg Pemberton of the D.C. Police Union. Angela Morabito is in for a uh, slightly ailing Julie Gunlock. Uh, Julie had appendicitis surgery appendix surgery yesterday she got rid of that damn thing who needs an appendix honestly what does an appendix do uh angela of course with the defense of freedom institute thanks for being here angela thanks for having me julie i hope you're on the mend hope you're feeling better uh we're going to talk as i mentioned at 835 with greg pemberton the president of the dc police union and of course it's about the growing crime problem here in america it's specifically here in D.C., though, but really it's every major city run by Democrats. I'm sorry, I'm I, I, not, not trying to be partisan. I, I know not everything is a Democrat-Republican thing. This is, though. This is. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the Democrats who have adopted all of these ridiculous policies in every major American city that has allowed crime to flourish. And D.C. has gotten worse and worse and worse. We told you yesterday about the attempted carjacking. It appears, well, I guess technically this isn't a carjacking. Carjacking is when you're in the car and they break into the car, rip you out of the driver's seat and just take your car. This would be car theft, good old-fashioned grand theft auto in Georgetown where somebody was breaking into a Secret Service vehicle as the Secret Service detail was in Georgetown protecting the granddaughter of Joe Biden, Naomi Biden, Hunter Biden's daughter. Uh, The incident occurred Overnight, we, it was just reported late in the morning yesterday, so we discussed it in our final hour. Secret Service agents apparently discharged their weapon three times, missed the assailants as they were running away and fleeing. They're still at large, I believe. But it was just another example of the outrageous crime that we're all experiencing here in the nation's capital, Angela. It's it's something to behold. My, I have family members who want to visit me, and they do they are worried about coming to their own capital city in their own country because of the crime problem. What a shame. And it seems like every other day there's an announcement of a new, of a different restaurant or, or business closing because it's just too unsafe or too expensive to operate. Their customers are scared away by rampant crime. And I can't say I blame them. When criminals feel emboldened to try to steal a car from the Secret Service, and those cars are pretty obvious, they're not super secret, despite the name about who they are. Yeah. You can tell it's a government vehicle. When criminals feel emboldened to do that, crime is off the rails. We uh, will get into a little bit more in a moment about what Mayor Bowser did yesterday, announcing a public emergency over juvenile crime as well as the opioid epidemic. We'll get to that in a moment. But as we're still discussing the Secret Service's involvement in the Georgetown incident Sunday night, we also have an update on the Secret Service investigation or lack thereof into the White House cocaine The Daily Mail obtained exclusive photos of the baggie of cocaine that was discovered. And I didn't realize this before, uh, and I apologize if this was out there and and not reported, but apparently the little baggie of cocaine was actually found in a cubby locker that is used by people entering a skiff or a zone in any government building that does not allow cell phones. I think anybody who works downtown... Uh, whether it's in the executive branch or in the legislative branch, you've seen these things before. You've probably attended meetings. I know I have, where you have to put your phone into a little cubby, a little locker space right outside the office that you're about to enter, whether it's a conference room or somebody's office, so that there's no 
a danger of something being overheard or picked up on your cell device, right? That's or or for that matter, you nefariously recording the session. Now, some of these cubbies are just that, just a little empty space. You put your phone in there and you're on the trust system. You're hoping nobody comes and jacks your phone away. But some of them actually are lockers, little little locker spaces that you can close and walk out with a key. This little baggie was left in one of those type of cubbies at the White House, and it had a little door. It's locker number 50, they call it. And there's that little packet of cocaine. So clearly, this little packet of cocaine must have been either in a little pocket attached to the phone case of somebody, or maybe they had it in their pocket. It came out with their phone as they put it in the cubby and then neglected to pick it up because they didn't realize. But uh, this is a new detail that is intriguing, to say the least, because clearly this cocaine belonged to somebody who had to attend a very official, high-level, secure meeting. And any time you enter into the White House, you have a couple different layers of screening. They ask for your social security number a couple times. They have, of course, the Secret Service out in full force. And they have uh, dogs, just like you would you would see at the airport, who are there to make sure that you cannot get harmful substances like that into the West Wing. So this is a major security failure. I also have to wonder, Larry, was this intentional? It's it's a locker. I mean, they're not. I've used those lockers. They're not very big. You can see everything in it. Pretty hard to leave something behind on accident. I wonder if someone was actually dumb enough to say, "I'm going to go leave my cocaine in a locker and hope it's there for me later." <laughs> I mean, I guess that's possible. I mean, this is the Biden White House. So, I mean, you mm-hmm. began the question, the rhetorical question, with. Is someone dumb enough? And I think the answer is, well, yes, actually. I can think of a handful of people just in the comms department at the White House. (laughs) I also got to give a lot of credit to the Daily Mail for exposing these photos. Not that the photos are going to help anybody solve this crime, but because it makes clear to the powers that be that people still care about this story. I mean, when this first blew up, I expected the government to spend about as much effort trying to find this person as they spent trying to find the Dobbs leaker, which seems to be none right. at all. I yeah. thought this was going to be something. They tried to bury their head in the sand. But the more that comes out about it, the less they're able to do that. Yeah. And, Liz, you know, the Secret Service conducted an 11-day investigation and concluded there wasn't enough evidence to implicate anybody. But I don't I don't know. I mean, this, this certainly narrows it down. They know that the cubby is used for people who enter a specific room, Mm -hmm. a specific conference room. And at the White House, you should be able to know exactly who has gone in and out of that room at any given time for meetings or what have you. But also there are cameras everywhere. So now you should know, you should be able to isolate over a 24, 36, 48 hour window, how many people have not only entered that room, but who among them used this specific cubby to put their stuff into? You should have camera images of every person who has even come close to cubby number 50, locker number 50. Why were you unable to isolate this? Something stinks here. You, I think they know exactly whose cocaine this is. They're just not saying or doing anything about it, but that's just my opinion. All right, Angela, a little bit more about crime in this town, not just the the cocaine crime at the White House, also the opioid crisis and the epidemic of violent crime in Washington, D.C., and what Mayor Bowser is acting like she's doing about it. Not what she's doing about it, what she's acting like she's doing about it. We'll get to that in just a sec. But first at 6.15, WMAL traffic and weather every 10 minutes, first on the thighs with Jamie Witten in the Hadid Carpet Cleaning Traffic Center. Miss anything? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Get today's breaking news on the Vince Colony Show weekdays, 3 to 6, right here on WMAL. All right, so yesterday, Mayor Bowser declared a public emergency for D.C., over the juvenile crime crisis and the opioid epidemic. The announcement comes at a time where it seems like too little too late after months and months, if not years, of horrific increase in criminal activity, really dating back to the George Floyd Black Lives Matter riots of summer of 2020, when the same Mayor Bowser and the District Council and every Democrat in charge of the District of Columbia 
basically signaled that crime would not be enforced, laws would not be enforced, criminals would not be put in jail, unless, of course, you were involved in a protest on January 6th. Uh, They made this announcement yesterday in an attempt to show that they're doing something. Uh, Bowser's office said the emergency declaration will allow D.C. government to respond more efficiently and urgently. Yeah, no one believes that. Uh, authorizing expedited procurement, disbursement of funds, activation, implementation, and coordination of mutual aid agreements between the district, federal, and state or local jurisdictions as appropriate. These are all things that the city government is supposed to do on a regular basis anyway. Uh, But again, until things were suspended, until Black Lives Matter and defund the police was emblazoned across the streets of D.C. in a mural, and the move to uh, defang the criminal justice system that was already week in the first place it was done for political purposes and now those politics have come home to roost that's why people are unsafe in our city and crime continues to skyrocket i think this is too little too late i think you're absolutely right and we are living in the consequences of progressive policies there are there are two lessons that young people in dc were taught in 2020 the first is that schools were not essential They were kept closed for way too long and kids got the message. Okay, school's not essential. Got it. The second message is that crime wasn't going to be prosecuted. They could go out in the streets, do whatever they want, zero consequences. They clearly took that message to heart. And here we are three and a half years later faced with a juvenile crime crisis. Um, They talk about mutual aid and direct assistance, which is just government speak for more money being the solution to the problem. No, the solution to the pro- to the problem is strong families and good schools. Yep. If a child has those two things, they're not going to resort to crime. We know that. We know that from every study. We know that from our firsthand experience. We know that from the lives that we've lived. Our What do the liberals like to say? Our lived experience. We know that from our lived experience. You have strong, stable families. You encourage fathers in the home instead of having public policies that actually encourage women to raise children on their own instead of actually uh, having a, a stable nuclear family. And uh, and you take care of the crime problem almost overnight, frankly. We've also seen from firsthand experience that if you don't overlook what used to be called petty crime, petty theft, you know, the, the whole effort to decriminalize fair jumping in Metro actually was an indication that we don't take law and order seriously. When you start prosecuting people for those small crimes, like like graffiti and vandalism and truancy, you're sending a message to society at whole that you have that you hold law and order to be a principle that must be adhered to, that this is important to us. When you overlook all those things and make excuses for criminals, then guess what? Criminals will take the message and they'll continue to break the law. Uh, Two quick things on this as well. Uh, First, you've got to hear this comment from the deputy mayor. This is the new deputy mayor that Muriel Bowser appointed, and she was making a statement here at the announcement of the public emergency. And, and, And this is probably one of the greatest truisms I've ever heard from a public official. Listen. We can't fail to provide them with the services they need because if they're not alive, we can't help them. I mean... The the, bril- the sheer brilliance in that statement. You know, the real problem here is that we're trying to provide services to people in the city, and if they're not alive, then we can't actually provide those services. Are you kidding me? I wish this was satirical. It's so <laughs> sad that it's true, that it's we're going to keep people alive long enough that we can get them some kind of help. What a yeah. unique state of affairs. But I'm glad she said it, Larry. I'm glad she called attention to this so well, that people would see just how absurd the situation has become. We're, we're having a real problem providing c- city services to people who were dead. So so we really we ha- we have to fix the crime problem so we can continue to fi- f- funnel all our government programs to them. Can we hear it one more time? It's too stupid to believe. We can't fail to provide them with the services they need because if they're not alive we can't help them well there you have it i mean forget about deputy mayor she should be the mayor of this town you can't you can't fight logic like that she should at least be the head of communications that's for sure just just (laughs) for the entertainment value uh meanwhile 
all the usual suspects are coming out and criticizing Mayor Bowser, not from my perspective, which is it's too little too late, and you'd actually get more done if you just enforced the law and kept people behind bars after arresting them. No, no, no. Apparently, Mayor Bowser's being too tough here. The uh, Georgetown University Law Center visiting professor Eduardo Ferrer is raising alarms that uh, huge concerns that this is going to actually uh, be too rough on the criminals. Listen, rather than building jail cells, rather than building more detention, we should be focused on building strong young people, strong families and strong communities. When you're not doing any of that. Uh, just increasing direct cash assistance and support for families is a much better use of our time and attention. In other words, don't don't enforce the law. Don't build more jails. Just give them cash. Just write a check and give money to them because they won't use that to buy opioids. They won't waste that money. No, no, no. Just give them direct cash assistance, and that'll be a better use of our time and money. That's why he's a visiting professor at Georgetown Law Center instead of actually doing something constructive with his life. I am a double Hoya, Larry, and I hear stuff like this and just cringe uh, <laughs> what passes for scholarships these days. But this is progressivism in action. It's we'll throw more money at the problem, say some nice fluffy words about it, and pretend like it's gotten better. He's talking about building strong kids, building strong communities. That sounds great. The government can't do that. There's no successful community that's been raised up by the government. You, you need families for that, and he's completely yeah. neglecting that fact. Angela, there was a time after criticizing Georgetown where I could have said, well, at least they've got a great basketball team, but I can't oh. even say that now. <laughs> Sorry. It's 624. <laughs> we'll give you a preview of today's march supporting Israel on the mall. Keep it here. WMAL-FM, Woodbridge, Washington, a cumulus media station. Making sense of the news. News Talk 105.9. WMAL. WMAL. Now. On News Talk 105.9 WMAL. O'Connor and Company. 636 now on O'Connor and Company. Thanks for tuning in. Coming up in uh, 30 minutes at 7.05, Representative August Fluger of Texas on the border crisis. 7.35, Mark Poletta, latest out of the Supreme Court and the continued attacks on Clarence Thomas. 8.05, Adam Gillette, Accuracy in Media. And at 8.35, Greg Pemberton, Chairman of the D.C. Police Union. I'm Larry O'Connor with Angela Morabito, who is in for an ailing Julie Gunlock. Angela, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And today here in D.C., down on the mall from 1 to 3 p.m., gates opening at 10 a.m., there will be a march. Americans will unite shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, linking arms, marching for Israel, marching to free the hostages, and marching against anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism that sadly we have seen in outward display all too often in the last four or five weeks since the October 7th attacks. Joining us right now to discuss this is William Daroff. He's the co-organizer of this march, and he joins us today. Thank you, Mr. Daroff, for being here. Thank you, Larry and Angela. It's a pleasure to be with you. I want to say I'm 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 really sorry that this is even needed, but it is needed. And I want you to sort of lay out what you have seen uh, unveiled in this country, in major American cities, right here in D.C. over the last several weeks that drove you to the point where you said, no, we we need to stand up. Jews need to stand up. And every American who is a friend of Israel needs to stand up and do something about it. Well, you framed it perfectly. Since the barbarous attack of October 7th by the Hamas terrorist army on civilians living in southern Israel, we've not only seen the increase in violence Uh, and war that's happening in Israel with this unprovoked attack. But we've seen in America and throughout the world attacks on Jews, increases in anti-Semitic violence in Jew hatred across the board, Uh, issues like uh, swastikas being painted on uh, in Jewish cemeteries, uh, people being uh, assaulted, uh, and the marches that you've talked about, the demonstrations by the pro-Hamas sympathizers, where they are dressed as Hamas terrorists, where they are marauding through various neighborhoods uh, in, in, throughout the country, uh, and where they are minimizing and trying to normalize the terror uh, of Hamas. It's absolutely outrageous. And among the goals of today's march are for the American people to hear loud and clear 
that what they're seeing and hearing from these pro-Hamas sympathizers is fringe. It's not where America stands. It's not where Americans stand. It's not where Congress stands. It's not where the president stands. And so there will be tens and thousands of us who will be on the National Mall to ensure that America knows that America stands with Israel, that America stands against anti-Semitism, and that America demands the immediate and unequivocal uh, and unconditional release of the hostages. William, Angela here. I love what you're doing with this march. And as you well know, you're going to have a lot of eyes on you uh, today with this project, including the eyes of college presidents, members of Congress, business leaders, a great many people who thus far have tried some really pretty awful moral equivalents here. They're going to be watching. What message do you hope this sends to them specifically? Excellent, excellent points, Angela. Those are exactly among the target audiences. We want America's leaders to know that this increase in anti-Semitism, this minimalization and rationalization of terror is not indicative of where mainstream America stands. That You might see 100 people demonstrating here or 1,000 people at Harvard Square, but Main Street America is firmly in step with Israel's fight against the Hamas terrorist army with demanding the an unconditional release of the hostages, and with speaking out about this anti-Semitism, this tsunami of anti-Semitism um, that has unfortunately en- enveloped much of America. Um, the message needs to be loud and clear to these leaders, to these college presidents and others, that this, as you put it, this moral equivalence, this wishy-washiness is just incredibly unacceptable in the 21st century in America. What happened on October 7th is not one of these, uh, It's I say six, you say half a dozen, I say half full, you say half empty. There could be nothing more clear than the moral um, turpitude of having uh, these Hamas terrorists raised up in any way. And that's precisely what these Hamas sympathizers are doing with their demonstrations, is saying that, you know, it's just like a, another baseball team. We're watching Baltimore against uh, Washington, and that's yeah. not what this is. Yeah, well said, Mr. Daroff. And and you say that this doesn't reflect the majority of Americans and our love for the people of Israel and and certainly our abhorrence to anti-Semitism. Sadly, though, and I agree with you, but sadly, it is representative of a growing number of elected officials right now. And and you'll hear them making statements in the halls of Congress uh, saying, oh, we're not anti-Semitic, we're anti-Zionist. Could you please unpack that for us? Because I, I think it's too clever by half to try to thread that needle. It ain't working. Sure. There, there are two pieces of that. One is that uh, we hear loudly from a few members of Congress. The United States Senate unanimously passed a resolution condemning Hamas and supporting Israel in its fight against the Hamas terrorist army. The House of Representatives overwhelmingly with just nine votes against, who are the people that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. and everybody should look up who they are, uh, overwhelmingly passed a similar resolution, supportive of Israel and condemning the Hamas terrorist army. So the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of Congress is in the right place. We hear loud voices from, frankly, the squad uh, that uh, they get get picked up by your colleagues in the media, but that doesn't represent where most of our elected officials are, thank God. As it relates to Zionism, you're absolutely right. What has happened today is that we see people who are attacked for the actions of the government of Israel solely because they are Jewish. These Jews who are attacked on the streets of Brooklyn and elsewhere are not part of the Israel Defense Force High Command. They're not generals. They're not deciding anything about the war. Yet, because they're wearing a yarmulke, because they're coming out of a Jewish restaurant, because they're in a synagogue, they're targeted. That is prima facie anti-Semitism. They are being blamed for the conduct of a foreign government. We've seen this before, where Jews are often, unfortunately, blamed for the ills of society, blamed for any sort of disagreements that they are. And right today, when someone says that they don't believe in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination, meaning they don't believe that Jews uh, have a right uh, to live in Israel or for Israel to exist, that is anti-Semitic, period. That's where it's coming from. Uh, It's really devaluing the price of Jewish life. If this massacre that happened on October 7th in Israel happened anywhere else in the world and the Jews weren't the victims, there's no way that you'd have this moral equivalence. You'd have these professors who would uh, use their logical uh, um, tricks in order to try to rationalize what occurred. People were murdered. Civilians were murdered. 
That's wrong, period. People who are on the other side of that are wrong, period. Quickly, sir, the march is today from 1 to 3. The gates open at 10 a.m. I know you're expecting tens of thousands, if not over 100,000, for the March for Israel. Are you concerned about counter-protesters? We have seen violence break out in multiple cities, and I want to reiterate, it is always, I've seen the videos, it is always instigated by those who claim to be pro-Palestinian uh, against people who are counter-protesting and, and marching on right. behalf of, of the victims of this attack and the hostages that are still being held. Are you concerned about that, and has there been any indication that there is a security concern today? Uh, first off, I'd say they're not pro-Palestinian, they're pro-Hamas. Yes. Hamas is imprisoning the Palestinian people, not allowing them to have humanitarian aid, diverting funds that could, could do, go towards food and medicine, uh, instead towards rockets and building a terrorist infrastructure. Thank you. Secondly, we are very much on top of uh, the security needs. The federal U.S. Department of Homeland Security has given this event their highest category of security, which means that there is an incredible amount of federal law enforcement resources that are engaged as well as uh, Metropolitan Police, WMATA Police, uh, Amtrak Police, the Capitol Police, the Park Police. Uh, the police are here in large uh, showing. Uh, we also have our own uh, security who will be in place. Uh, I encourage people to come. Uh, it's 12th Street between Independence and Constitution is the entrance. You do not need a ticket to come in, uh, but you do need to go through metal detectors. Uh, and we're uh, fairly confident that um, this afternoon at 1 o'clock, among the safest places to be in America, will be on the National Mall. All right. Thank you, sir, for joining us, and uh, good luck today. And we'll all be uh, watching and with you shoulder to shoulder right there with you, William Daroff. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It is 645 at the MAL Traffic and Weather Every 10 Minutes, first on the fives with Jamie Witten and the Hadid. We have a uh, deep concern over the threat to free speech uh, sadly, it's getting worse, Angela Morabito, as much as we like to spend time focusing on it. Listen to this latest statement. The governor of New York, Kathy Hochul. Also, we're very focused on the data we're collecting from surveillance efforts. What's being said on social media platforms? And we have launched an effort to be able to counter some of the negativity and reach out to people when we see hate speech being spoken about on, on online platforms. Our media analysis, our social media analysis unit has ramped up its monitoring of sites to catch incitement to violence, yeah. direct threats to others. It, it all sounds so so nice and Orwellian, doesn't it, uh, here? We're monitoring social media, our surveillance efforts, monitoring hate speech. The problem is they define hate speech as political speech that they disagree with. We've seen them do that. And you allow them this power and this influence and this authority, then they go after people that they we, we've seen them do it through their connections with Twitter during the 2020 election, silencing voices who were in their minds dangerous and inciting to riot because we were either questioning tactics that were happening during the election or we were promoting the Hunter Biden laptop story or we were questioning whether the uh, uh, COVID virus mandates that have been put in place were legitimate and effective. All of those things, of course, ended up being correct. But at that time, they were incitement language, and so they decided to censor it. This is this is chilling. It is. Uh, with this new project, Governor Hochul is positioning the government as the arbiter of what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, Larry, the government often gets it wrong. Look at the things that progressives think are hate speech. There, there are plenty of people out there today, far too many, I would say, who think it is hate speech to say a man cannot become a woman and a man yeah. doesn't belong in women's sports. That's right. 10 years ago, nobody disagreed with that. Yeah. Now, there's a large group of people who not only say it's wrong, but say it's hateful. And the state of Michigan just passed a bill that is making its way through the state Senate now, but the state, the House just passed a bill that would make it illegal to engage in so-called hate speech and harmful language, including uh, misusing somebody's pronouns. They would make that illegal. This is the kind of thing that we need to call out every time we see it and push back against. Otherwise, we won't have a First Amendment anymore.